subject here. And this picture that you see in here, this is first uh, Tree Campus USA Arbor Day that we had at Ettrick Elementary, which is just a half a mile away from the school here. And these kids amazed me. They were just gung-ho. They were enthusiastic as anything for that tree installation. Okay. Now, what we're going to talk about today is plant selection, installation tips, and web resources to help you determine what plants do best for your area. But the web resources, to be honest with you, is the least important. It's observation in the area. It's observation of what is doing well in the area that you want to do the installation at. Plant selection, we're going to go into as far as the genus, meaning maple or oak or pawpaw, whatever you want to plant based on the general genus that you're looking for. I start all of my lectures with these three myths because we have been taught incorrectly from grammar school on about woody plants. We've always given woody plants anthropomorphic traits. That means human animal traits primarily. We've always said plants heal. They do not heal. Animals heal. If plants healed, we wouldn't have hollow trees or we wouldn't have uh, damage evidence on the tree from its early age until it's declined. The damage is always there. Healing, a strict definition of healing is the replacement of damaged cells with uh, undamaged cells in the same location. Because plants, a 10 year old tree or 10 year old woody stem is 10 layers, one on top of the other. If I'm getting too elementary, just say so, please, okay? Uh, there's three growing points there. There's the cambium that gives the, uh, the stems and the twigs their girth. And the roots have a cambium, the trunk has a cambium, and the tiniest stem has a cambium. The other, uh, there's two other growing points. One is the buds at the ends of the twigs or the suppressed buds, which are down the trunk a little bit. That's a potential growing point. Then there's the uh, zone of elongation in the root zone. That is the third meristematic or growing area within a woody plant. Okay? And that is all from the outside to the outside to the outside. Whereas with animals, it's internal. Okay? There, there, there is no such thing as plant food. And I hear this all the time. Well, the plant isn't doing well. I have to feed it. No. Photosynthesis is the only... Uh, real food manufactured by the plant that sustains itself. It, that is, carbon dioxide in the presence of sunlight with water yields a sugar, a glucose sugar, and oxygen as a byproduct. And the sugar is the product that comes from the photosynthesis. We consume the sugar. Insects that are going after the plant consume the sugars because they can't manufacture their own, just like us. Uh, insects and diseases, because they're not able to manufacture their own food, they consume the food manufactured by photosynthesis. Uh, this is a point that I get a lot of pushback on because people say, well, everybody says feed the plant. I'm sorry, that is incorrect. Uh, this is one of the things where a hundred people are saying that you're wrong and the one person is saying there's no such thing as plant food. He's the correct person, not the 100. Um, and if anyone wants to discuss that, we can very quickly, okay? Uh, and that sugar that is manufactured drives the machine, just like the sugar in us through the metabolism within our body. The sugar is what drives the machine. It's a glucose type of sugar, not the sugar in a packet that you put in your coffee, but it's a glucose. It's very basic to sugar. Now, trees do not, or I should say plants, I'm sorry, 
plants do not have feeder roots. They have three types of roots, anchor, connective, conductive roots, and absorptive. The reason why I bring these three aspects or these three phrases out to really uh, bring them to light is because when we think of plants with feeder roots, feed the plant and healing, it sets our logic askew. Consequently, the therapy that we may recommend for the plant isn't suitable because we're not dealing with a proper hypothesis. We're a little bit askew with the theory, okay? Because uh, one of the biggest things that I get all the time being a practicing arborist is that somebody tells me, well, my tree is not growing well, I need to feed it. And then I try to explain to them what's in the soil is actually the benefit for the plant because the roots are one third of the three organs within the plant that are gonna send the needed nutrients to the foliage, which is gonna photosynthesize at proper levels to give the plant the health that it needs to survive. All right, any questions so far? Yeah. Oh, and then on the feeder roots, uh, the reason why I talk about absorptive roots is that all up and down the root system, from the anchor roots, which are the big, large roots, you have small roots coming off those that are actually absorptive roots also. And they are connected to the major roots and then that tissue is connected to the trunk and connected to, to the foliage. Think of woody plants, like these plants here in the picture. The trunk is the woody part, the roots, you can see some fibrous roots in the uh, slide on the right, right at the surface there, those are absorptive roots. Those absorptive roots are absorbing the minerals in the soil and are carrying them up to the top of the plant by the water loss in the foliage. If you will, it's similar to the slinky that we all played with as kids going down the steps. But in this case, the water is, and minerals are absorbed by the root system and then by the pull, by the transpirational pull of the water loss in the foliage, it's sucked all the way up to the top. And this is the way that water and minerals get all the way up to a tree. There's a lot of discussion going on right now in as far as the actual mechanism. But we can't forget that the xylem tissue, which is that inside the trunk that conducts the water and the minerals vertically from the ground to the foliage, has got charges on it. And water is a charged molecule. Consequently, if you will, it flip flops positive to negative, positive to negative, negative to positive, negative to positive, and it works its way all the way up by deficit gradient, where the water is lost in the foliage. It uh, has a lower concentration than further down in the water conducting tube. Then by de deficit gradient law, it has to eat, fill an equilibrium achieve an equilibrium and it does that because of the deficit gradient law and if i'm if i if i'm too technical say so also this slide here depicts plants not healing the slide on the left is one of my cherry trees that i bought this year in 2020 they were packed in a truck that came from the growing nursery packed one on top of the other, and they were shipped in March when the bark was slipping so much water <clears throat> in the system. The bark was very uh, passive, if you will, and by the shipping and the rough handling, it bruised the bark, it bruised the cambium just underneath the bark, consequently caused the death of the tissue just under the bark it rotted rapidly and then it broke. And it broke just in a slight wind, the one on the left. 
the one on the right is uh, damage at installation on a red maple, a thin bark maple that was damaged from the bucket that it was used, the front end loader bucket that it was put into, transported to the uh, site there for installation, and then it was bruised. And again, because most planting is done in the spring when the bark is very slipping and very uh, subject to bruising, that's where that wound occurred at. And that wound is going to be with that plant for the rest of its life. Uh, and it's also going to become a weak point, which is going to be a potential breakage point because each year that lever, which is the trunk, is going to be getting taller and rot is going to set in there. And at, at that uh, bad area, that the damaged area, is going to be a fulcrum for the lever and it's going to break at that point as time goes on. One of the worst things with woody plants is they don't respond rapidly as animals do. We get uh, we get a bruise, we get something, we get we can see the ramifications of the damage, and we can also see the healing process. Whereas with woody plants, they seal and compartmentalize. Cotted up at the top is the acronym for compartmentalization of decay in tree. It should be woody plants because if you're talking camellias, azaleas, uh, rhododendron, mountain laurel, all woody plants cut it. They compartmentalize, decay, and trees. And that is their physical and chemical reaction to the damage. They seal the damaged area to prevent the spread of uh, in invading pathogen by setting a barrier at the top and bottom of the damage and internally. So there's three walls that are set up to stop the invading pathogen from consuming the entire plant. And it works about 90% of the time. Now, plant selection is purpose dependent. Uh, uh, the topic of this is insulation, uh, selection and installation. What are what is the purpose of the plant that you want to plant? You need to screening. You, now screening is if you want to hide something, say a highway adjacent to your property or a neighbor, you want to hide the neighbor. Privacy is when you want to hide yourself away from peering eyes. And it does not have to be an impervious wall. Anytime that you can create a uh, not impenetrable, but a uh, op opaque barrier between prying eyes or between you and the object that you want to screen, your eye is not going to concentrate on that object past the opaque obstacle. A very dense tree, a very small tree with dense of branches, uh, like a willow oak or a Skyrex japonica, the silverberry, uh, um, yeah, the silverberry, or uh, oh goodness, uh, one just jumped out of my head. Would those type of plants with the dense branching habit create a barrier for the eye from your vision or from opposite outside of your property? It doesn't have to be a dense evergreen. It can be. That's one of the best but it doesn't have to be, okay? And depending on the location, uh, because so much depends on the soil that you're gonna be planting in, what you're gonna do, and we'll get into that here shortly. Uh, for most shading that you want, uh, it will be a tall, broad spreading tree like a tulip poplar, a white oak, ornamental, or the beauty, or ornamental flowers, or the foliage, and and or the texture of the plant. All three of those attributes lend towards the beauty. When I say the flowers, uh, American dogwood that we have in your area, uh, redbud grows prolifically in your area, 
and also the service area grows so well. Also called a shad boat around here in Central Virginia because when uh, when the surface area is in flower is when the shad were running, and that's when the Indians and also the pioneers would go shad fishing because they knew the water was warm enough for the shad to be running, and they were uh, spawning them. Now the foliage, a lot of things with great foliage. One plant that is overlooked and I think should be used more is the red mulberry because that foliage on that red mulberry to me with the glossy green on it and its various shapes are very beneficial. And then the texture with some of the pines and the hemlocks, the evergreen, the textures there really help out. And also, it's, uh, a lot of people don't really pay much attention to this, but the sound that is given from the different foliage types, the sound when the wind is coming through, uh, it, it can be a very um, soothing sound. Also, in the evergreen, uh, like with windbreak, for the evergreens with windbreak, and it, that creates, it reduces soil erosion by cutting down the loss of soil through the wind. It also helps to keep the soil moist because it reduces the wind and it can warm the structure. So the windbreak, and added with the windbreak is, uh, I would say Bob White habitat or river will habitat, and those are two small uh, pleasures that we overlook sometimes. But the benefit of the evergreen tree with the habitat for birds is just unbelievable, and it's very soothing to our psyche at the same time. Habitat, uh, this is something that more and more is uh, becoming recognized as a benefit to the proper use of trees and the proper uh, arrangement of the trees. Get a little bit later. Plant genus selection. I always recommend native because they are co-evolved with the native fauna and insects and provide a complete, or they help to complete the ecological system. And once they're established in a transplanted area, they require less maintenance, less water, and less fertilization because they have evolved for that particular location. Now, this is order of importance when you go to choose a plant. Environmental correctness. Environmental correctness meaning that you want the plant, if you in a dry site, you don't want to use a bottom ground tree like, a, like an elm or a Tupelo, a water tupelo. You don't want to put a wet foot plant in a dry site. Mature size, that's your second consideration. Amount of maintenance required. Finally, the last uh, criteria is the aesthetic. Mainly from the standpoint, if you start with environmental size of maintenance, the aesthetics are going to be there with less maintenance. A lot of people argue this point because, oh, I love the looks of this tree, but I, I will say a dogwood, but I want to put it in full sun in Central Virginia. That dogwood isn't going to do well. It's going to flower for a few years, but longevity is not going to be there because it is growing out of its natural habitat. The environmental consists, uh, environmental requirements consist of the soil, soil moisture, amount of light, temperature generally cold temperature and elevation. Is it bottom brown? Is it a plant that grows well in a floodplain? Or does it grow higher up the floodplain in a mesic situation where it can be wet for a short period of time, but it's mostly dry? Mature size is something that so many folks disregard and don't really pay much attention to. But yet, so many plants are installed when they're young and keep in mind, when the plant is installed, it is a baby. It's a very uh, juvenile biomass. It's very full of thin and vigor, and it is uh, very virulent and very, uh, very, uh, I'm sorry, not late in the afternoon. It, 
very virulent and very uh, adaptable, very adaptable, and it is prone to grow like hell when it's younger, okay? But as it matures, it slows down in growth, and it also becomes more uh, susceptible to adverse conditions. One of the final characteristics that you have to look for is availability. Is the plant available with its crate or in your area? Can you dig it from the woods and then move it? Is it a litter plant? Does it cause a lot of litter like American sycamore? Does it have a lot of pests like a box elder? brings in pests all the time. Is it sensitive to air pollution or is it sensitive to the pollution in that area? Okay. Be it car pollution, be it industrial pollution, or no pollution. Okay. And legal restrictions, that's more for metropolitan areas where certain metropolitan areas don't allow you to plant uh, trees such as mulberry, white mulberry, which is invasive. There's many invasives that can't be planted legally. Uh, also, silver maple is one that they have a moratorium on the planting. And another one is female ginkgo because of the uh, foul smelling fruit that the ginkgo gives off. Any questions so far? Now, here's light quality or lack of. It's a foggy day that I took this, but <laughs> what I'm trying to show here is how the one tree, that smaller tree, that was planted underneath that large oak on the right-hand side because of hormones within the woody plant. And they've isolated 11 hormones in woody plants right now. Short of the nervous system, woody plants are as complicated and are as complex as animals are and they communicate within themselves and within adjacent plants <clears throat> for their own protection and for their own survival. But this plant is growing towards the sun. Since everything originates with the sun, this plant is growing towards the sun based on the oxen hormone reaction to the shade on the shaded side of the plant, causing an elongation of the cells on the shaded side, which creates the growth on the left hand on the on the sunny side also more growth for weight this in time is going to create a hazard because of the architecture of that plant and the strain put on the wood and on the collar at the soil line now reclaim the disturbed native soil in reclaimed soil this Really, this is both of those are showing. Both slides are showing parent material, really not soil, because the soil has been removed. It's the whole area, both areas, have been graded. The uh, slide on the left is right down to parent material. There is zero soil there. It is as impervious as concrete. Consequently. And that's because they're going to get set to build a house. And to build the house, you have to have sound soil so the foundation doesn't shrink or swell. It doesn't shift. So they have to get down to what is called 95% compaction, meaning that in a soil that they're going to build on, there is zero, there's only 5% pore space in that soil, whereas plants require 50% pore space, 25% pore space filled with air, 25% pore space filled with water, and then 45% with the uh, mineral matter and 5% organic matter. The, those requirements are thrown out the window in both of those situations. The, both those situations for in, installing plants and for them to grow and do well the soil needs to be re-oxygenated and the planting pit that the tree or the plant to put in needs to be oxygenated where you have what's called wane, water, air, nutrient exchange. When you have proper wane, water, air, nutrient exchange, you have proper 
infiltration of air in, into the soil, infiltration of water, and by those two elements, air and water, the roots are able to grow. Microbes are able to grow in the soil, which builds the soil, which makes the soil nutritious for the plant to gain the nutrients given by the microbial activity in the soil. Also, you can use mycorrhiza. Uh, mycorrhiza is a beneficial fungus that creates a symbiotic relationship with plant roots. And mycorrhiza is specific to plants from the area. The mycorrhiza in your area in Southwest is different than the mycorrhiza here in Central Virginia. And you can get the mycorrhiza, if you look at the slide on the right here, by going into the wooded area, digging soil out of that, and digging some roots from those pines and the hardwoods there, and bringing that out to the planting area that you want to plant in. That mycorrhiza will build the soil and will also enhance the root absorptive potential. It mainly enhances root absorptive potential with phosphorus. Phosphorus is one of the most important elements to plant because it is very important for energy, very important for the um, transfer of energy and for the, all the metabolical processes that the plant has to undergo to survive. Nitrogen is very important, yes, it is very volatile. When you put nitrogen out, only 20% may be available to the plant. The other 80% can be volatilized, tied up in the, uh, the mineral matter of the soil, tied up in organic matter in the soil, or be leached out, depending on the type of nitrogen. So the phosphorus from mycorrhiza uh, induction into barren soil is very important. I hesitate hesitate greatly to recommend buying packaged mycorrhiza, mainly from the standpoint it's a fungus and it's packaged. It's made out of your area, it's made uh, New York State, Pennsylvania, those are two producers of it. The mycorrhiza there is specific for that area and not only that, it's a fungus packaged in a uh, water type airtight sealed pouch. There are studies that have been done, you're getting 1% viable active uh, mycorrhiza inoculum when you buy it over the counter. I suggest going into the woods and bringing it from the woods to the area that you want to plant. Because in these two soils here, the degraded soil from construction and also uh, the one on the left a lot of the grade has been changed, so you could say it's deposited soil, which created an interface between the two uh, original grade and then the deposited grade. Uh, and then the degraded soil on the right by the compaction and tearing away of the organic matter. Both those, in time, will rejuvenate themselves, but to help them, you need to use the mycorrhiza and the beneficial funguses in the area and mulch. Mulch by itself on top, good layer of mulch will really create a habitat conducive for the, what's called the soil food web. The soil food web is the interaction of uh, microscopic organisms and uh, insects within the soil that generate oxygenated healthy soil that the plant roots will take advantage of. And it will add nitrogen to the area in the, in the proper form that the plant can absorb too. Uh, mitigation of poor soil. Always pH. Check the pH because in this area here in Central Virginia uh, on that uh, slide on the right, that housing complex in, in Lakeville County, some of those soils can have a pH of five. 
believe it or not, it's hard to believe. Don't hesitate to do a soil sample and the perkability. See how well the soil is going to drain. And the, uh, what is the texture? You can use a field test uh, by moistening the soil and then roll it in your finger or roll it between your hands to see if it holds together. If it doesn't hold it together, it's very sandy. Or if it holds together too much, then it's high in clay. Uh, sampling is very important for choosing the proper plant for the site. That's soil sampling, so you know what you're beginning with. Because one third of the plant is going to be in the soil, and that's where it's going to be gaining most of its nutrients and most of its benefit from the soil, which is going to benefit the area part. And <clears throat> if the proper plant is used for that site, maintenance is going to be reduced. Okay. Now, succession comes in here. There's a lot of uh, studies, actually, not new studies, but revisiting these studies on succession. If the site on the left of that previous slide was left fallow by itself, you would get uh, herbaceous plants coming in, non-woody plants, and then woody plants would come in like black locust, which is a in the pea family, and it's a nitrifying uh, plant that would help to build the soil. And each of the levels of hardwoods that come in, like the locust, and then the maples, the soft hardwoods, they have a nick, and also the pine. They build the soil for successive uh, introduction of other plants to be brought in by birds or mammals. Now, it's very important to realize that the roots are a third of the system, and uh, healthy roots are coming from healthy soil. If you have healthy roots, you have a healthy plant, and that uh, healthy root system can be perpetuated by water, air, nutrient exchange. Okay. And keep in mind that you've got three organs, stem, roots, and forward, that need to work in harmony. And if one of the three is out of whack, the other two are going to suffer. Uh, mature size. Again, here on the left is the uh, tree planted too close to the wolf tree over the top of it, causing it to grow towards the road and towards the sunny side. This on the right, this tree is in the mahogany family. It is a china berry. And it was planted right next to the house there, the white house, and it had no place to grow but towards the opening. Consequently, uh, that's just an action of waiting to happen because it's so top heavy and there's no root under the foundation of that house. So all of the roots are on one side of the tree. Okay. Consequently, if a stiff wind would come along with that uh, very dense foliage of the top, it's almost like a, uh, oh goodness, it would be like a balloon being pushed during the wind at time of spring. The wind would just be able to take it over. So, Mature size, always consider mature size when you're doing the installation. Now, these are <clears throat> the tree on the left is a willow oak that was planted in 1978 by the Garden Club of Petersburg on campus here at Virginia State. That tree has got ample root zone and ample aerial growth to grow, just as the two as the live oaks on the right hand side from. Newborn, hey, North Joel, Carolina. Ample room. Ample room. Hey, Joel? Yes, sir. Uh, you're, you're having some problems with your audio. Uh, oh. We can barely hear you. There's something going on there with your audio, with your mic or something. Okay. Oh, all right. All right. You need me to speak up then? Uh, no, it's, it's something with your mic. Uh, you sound great. It's, it's, uh, it's just a loud noise. Oh, I don't. Okay. I don't hear it. Uh, do, you, do you still hear it? I can still hear it, yes. Let me turn. Is this helping by turning this down on the um, on the computer? That, it, it's a little is better. 
It is better there. Oh, did that help? Yes. I can. We can still hear it, but it's a little better. Okay. I, I just turned it down on the computer. I'm sorry about that. I'm sorry. Okay. No problem. Go ahead. Okay. Sorry about that. All right. Thank you. Um, all right. Goodness. Um, the slide on the, I'll speak, uh, is this any better? Yes, it is better. We can still hear it though. Still really loud. Damn, I'm sorry. Wow. But it's better than what it was. Okay. All right. Uh, the slide on the right, uh, is live oaks. Uh, those are live oaks that could be about 200 years old in, uh, Newburgh, North Carolina. And the fascinating thing on the those live oaks, those roots of those oaks will root graft under under the soil. And they'll one tree can be supplying two or three other trees with beneficial nutrients and with water. They can uh, coexist and benefit one another with their root grafting. And uh, it's just a fascinating thing to me how in a woodlot such as this here, once you get it established, the trees will, or the woody plant, can take care of themselves. But it also has a downside. If a disease was to come in, the disease can run through those all those trees through the root graft, go from one to another, from an infected tree to a non-infected tree, and then infects the non-infected trees. Uh, like up in up in the Midwest, the American elm, well, and also the chestnut down in your way, the chestnuts that were wiped out by the blight, that was root grafted also, and then did a lot of destruction. And the elm, Dutch elm disease, uh, in our area and further north, root grafts destroyed an awful lot. So there's good and bad with the uh, community, if you will, planting techniques. Now the root systems need to grow and the root systems have the same characteristics as, as the trunk. They have a, um, a bark on the outside, they have a cambium and they have a xylem. The big difference is the root systems have more storage cells and are more prone to infection because of the uh, thinness of their walls, they're easily uh, invaded by pathogens when you do a lot of cutting or a lot of drying, something of that nature, causes root death, which can cause, as the slide on the right will show you, this is right next to a road, causes top dieback because there's not enough nutrients to supply the top for the foliage. The slide on the right is a roadway. It gets exposed to salt, gets exposed to uh, petroleum products from the vehicles parked under it, and also a very limited root zone because of the pavement. The slide on the left shows what happened when good old concrete that was poured back in the 40s is, in, is not penetrated by the root system. Consequently, because each year, the root system gains girth just as the trunk. You can see how it grows out of the area and doesn't grow under the pavement because that is much better concrete. Older concrete is much better than what is put out these days. Uh, but the slide on the right just shows how the root system will adapt itself and will help to supply the top as best it can. Is is that noise still there? Phil, is, is that yes. noise still there? Yes, it's still there, yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Huh. I don't it's know what- It's not as it once was, but it's still there, yes. Okay, all right. Well, You're fine, go ahead. Okay, all right. Now, native community versus the way that we do it. 
whenever you plant at your location, if you can put two or three trees together in the same spot, such as the native community as they grow in nature, the more we mimic nature, the better the plants will serve us up and the longer the echo services will be uh, benefiting us. The way that we plant and design now, on the right hand side, that is a sugar maple planted in uh, turf. There's no mulch, there's no regeneration of nutrients in the soil there. And you can see that black U on the bark of that tree. That's actually sooty mold growing from the insect's excretion on that sugar maple. Uh, whenever you see that black sooty mold, you have an insect problem. Or, uh, or you could have a yellow belly sapsucker problem on a sugar maple or on apples and pecans and some of the nut trees. The yellow belly sapsucker will poke holes in the same plane in late winter and then the sap is rising, the sap comes out, it's high in sugar, insects come and feed on that uh, sugary sap, the yellow belly sap sucker comes back and picks off the insects. Um, but when you see the blackness, that's something that is not beneficial. There's a problem with that plant. And you'll see it in urban areas on every maple because the Trees are not growing with proper mulch and wane. They don't have good wane, water, air, nutrient exchange. Consequently, the water pressure, PSI, in the xylem isn't what it should be, making it easier for the insects to invade the bark and get into the xylem. When the proper water pressure is in the xylem, it's high enough to force the insect out and he's not able to make entry. When the water pressure is low, then he can gain entry and then can start the demise of the tree. As the pathogen will, he's not going to kill the plant, but he's going to weaken it. Individual plant selection. Once you have the species or the genus selected based on environmental conditions and uh, size, uh, when I say environmental and also physical conditions, size of sunlight and water and so on, and then the aesthetics that you're after, go to individual plants. That, that means choosing the plant at the nursery. Don't be bashful at the nursery or in the woods if you go to dig, dig something up, okay? You've got bald and burlap plants, and you've got, uh, that's where the soil is on the root system, and then it's in a burlap bag. Weight can be a problem, okay? When you buy a ball of burlap plant, don't go for the biggest thing going. It's numerous studies have shown the smaller the tree you put in, the faster it reestablishes itself in its new setting, and then the more growth that you get in a shorter period of time. I can take you to two or three places in Richmond here where they planted big trees, six, eight inch trees with big equipment. They, the trees are still the same size 20 years after they were planted. And that is no joke. I mean, it's just unbelievable. Uh, then you've got container grown and those you have to be careful of uh, girdling roots. Don't be bashful with the girdling roots. Cut them, cut them, cut them, okay? Don't be bashful. The most important, and then you've got bare root, which is possibly the best way to go with plants. It's very hard to find bare root plants these days, but you can at the orchard nursery, will ship things in the very late winter, early spring, bare rooted, okay? And don't be afraid to check the roots out when you're buying a plant, okay? Pull it out of the pot, have a look at it. Is it full of girdling roots? Is it full of girdling roots the size of your pinky that will not straighten out. Those are the roots that need to be cut from the uh, container grown plant and also ball the burlap plant. There is a method called Missouri gravel bed that uh, you put 
you wash all the material off of the uh, bulb and burlap or the container plant and you put it in gravel and irrigate it and in six weeks time you've got a flush of used uh, absorptive root system. The slide on the left is a girdling root at ground level. Slide on the right is what's called a J root where the plant grew only roots on one side in that container. Consequently, you just have the roots on the one side, which doesn't lead to a very good top because that one root won't supply the top. And again, these are things that you need to look for in the nursery and at the nursery. These are girdling roots. Here, this is mature trees with proper uh, flare root configuration. And these are uh, from, this is a wood lot that was built in the wood lot. But these are natural, proper root systems. Okay. Now, defects are not only at the, at the root system. The red bud on the right, that's a split fork, co-dominant fork. You don't really want to plant that plant because of that split fork, okay? It's only going to get worse. That's co-dominant. The uh, brown leaves you see on that red bud is from girdling roots. The tree was killed from girdling roots. It just choked itself out. The slide on the left shows um, where they put rope, they read burlap a tree, and they put rope around it without a uh, protective carrier on the on the bark. You can see how it girdled the bark right there. That's, uh, I took that tree out, was getting set to plant it, was moving the rope around and saw that and took it back to the nursery. They said, well, you know, there's no guarantee. I said, yeah, but are you going to sell me this garbage? Uh, so you, uh, I'll hush up. These are defects unaddressed. Here's the split co-dominant fork. This is over a road. Uh, this maple piece can go at any time, and there's a highly traveled road underneath that split maple piece. This is a girdling root on the left-hand side that is going to uh, strangle that upper crown of that tree, and it's going to need an early demise. And that's probably a 400-hour tree installed. And then they have to pay for the removal and also for the replacement of it. Installation tips. Okay, do not intern the plant when you plant it. Plant it at the same grade as is the uh, as is the collar. Right on the slide on the left, you can see the collar is where those roots are coming out. Plant it no deeper than that and not too high because you don't want to bury it. You want to plant it at the same grade. The deeper you go in the soil, especially compacted soil, less available air and water there is, okay? Dig the hole no deeper than the ball step. Container plants need root cut and reduce the girdling roots, the girdling large roots. Those are roots the size of your pinky or your thumb. And if they start encircling, cut them because the rejuvenated root coming back from that isn't going to start girdling. Okay. And girdling takes time. Okay. It could take 10, 15 years, but then it's, but it is going to happen. When you're planting, huddle it in. Plant, set the tree in the hole, fill it up halfway, fill the uh, hole up with water, give it time to perk the water down. The water will uh, send the soil around all the roots. Do not stomp that soil because you're just creating compaction. Fill it up the rest of the way and then water it again and you're set. Only stake is absolutely necessary. Absolutely. Here's improper installation. Uh, the one on the left I call a plunger planting and you know like a plumber's helper. You can see the excess soil was placed on top of the um, on top of the ball, as opposed to getting rid of the soil. It was placed on the ball. Those fibrous root systems are coming up to where there's air and water at the top of the grade there. 
the one on the right was where it was a uh, plumber type of planting, a plunger planting, and a strong rainstorm washed all the soil and the mulch away. And the, the plant, for survival reasons, set out a secondary root system in the mulch, trying to gain, if you will, needed nutrients and water in that raised grade there in the plunger area. However, that area is void of nutrition really and also being mulch is one of the first to dry out. And that's what was left after the heavy rain were those secondary, those adventitious roots that the trunk send out trying for survival. Plants are very survival oriented. The, uh, their goal is to reestablish themselves and then become in the new area and start growing. These are extreme girdling roots, but it's so common with improper insulation. You just have to be careful not to uh, cause this premature death by the girdling roots. Girdling roots are similar to you putting a tourniquet on a five-year-old's arm and expecting the, the five-year-old's arm to develop properly. It just cuts the vascular flow off and it hinders the aerial and the subterranean flow of nutrients. Now, this is a complete system here. This is where it works. The sugar maple on the left, it, this was taken just after it broke into new leaf. Uh, it says one, one of two, seven. That's just my camera is messed up. But the uh, sugar maple is doing well. The lawn is doing well this time of year. Come August, that lawn is brown as anything because of the shade of the tree. Trees do not take nutrients away from lawn. They actually shade the lawn and by the reduced sunlight, they encourage more disease because of the reduced sunlight. The disease is what kills out the lawn, not tree roots, okay? Everybody wants to blame the tree. They blame the trees also for cracked foundations when it's mostly shrink swell soil, not the tree's fault. The tree on the right is a 500-year-old live oak at uh, Fort Monroe in Hampton, Virginia. Uh, we've been working on that tree now a couple of years. You can see the top, how it's uh, regressing a little bit, a little bit of dieback there at 12 o'clock and then again at two o'clock. And uh, we're working on that, trying to rejuvenate the root system because without the healthy root system, you don't have a healthy top and vice versa because think of trees as, or woody plants as giant straws and they draw the nutrients from the soil to the roots from the roots to the trunk to the twig, all the way out to the forest. And then the forest sends sugars back to the root system. And each year, each year, the aerial part of the tree needs to grow along with the root system. The root system has to grow enough to satisfy the top's requirement for water and nutrients. And the sugars manufactured in the top have to supply the root system so that can grow to satisfy the top for next year. Plants are always growing for next year. They're growing for the successive year. They don't care about two years ago or last year. Their intent is to grow enough and satisfy the requirements for the upcoming growing season. And here are a couple of uh, eye trees. These are sites that will help you in choosing plants. Eye tree design, you, you can uh, uh, give them your address on Google Earth and tell them what size of tree that you want to plant in 2021 or 2020, because right now is a great time to plant. And they'll tell you, you can put in five, 10, 15, up to 20 years, they'll show you how much that tree will grow. And also it's, Echo services that it will be providing, amount of stormwater mitigation, the amount of carbon sequester, the amount of solar radiation reduction to help with cooling, uh, and also the uh, 
amount of particulate matter that the tree will be taking out of the atmosphere that will be beneficial for your lungs. Okay? Uh, DEQ has got a native plant website along with a uh, floor of Virginia map that goes county by county showing you what plant you can put a plant in to that website for uh, floor of Virginia and it will show you what counties that it grows in naturally in the Virginia, in the state of Virginia. Uh, the, if you want more help with selection, don't hesitate uh, to contact me. And I'm going through this last slide here because I'm out of time. In your area, this is a real good website here, Heritage and Native Plant Finder. But uh, goodtreecare.com can, it's a uh, from International Society of Arborists, Mid Atlantic chapter, which is Virginia, Maryland, West Virginia, and uh, DC. It gives you good advice on plants in our area, okay, in our Mid Atlantic area. And I'm, I'm over, I'm sorry. I'll take any questions. I'm not going anywhere. I'm sorry for the for the sound. I apologize. I don't know what caused that. Any okay. questions? No, no problem. That uh, was still a great presentation. I appreciate your your time, Joel. Uh, any, anybody have any questions? Great information, Joel. Thanks so much. Well, you're more than welcome. More than welcome. My pleasure. I hope I didn't go too fast. <laughs> it, was, it was just right. Thank you. We what, um, I, And I know that we have a, a couple of uh, master gardeners, actually four master gardeners in the group. So, uh, uh, and you had sent me a survey. I'll make sure that they get that and, okay. uh, and get that back to you. Okay. Uh, let's see. Okay, Jaquita, you had a comment you said? So we, we have somebody type in a comment. Oh, okay. Um, and I, I don't know if you can see that, Joel, but uh, she says about four years ago, when we were working to build a new home, one of the few trees in the yard was damaged by equipment. Yes. Uh, my dad insisted that we cover the exposure before the sun went down. So we did. Four the, years uh, later. Uh, no, tree paint and all things like that, it, it doesn't do any good. Mainly from the standpoint, trees caught it, they compartmentalize, they set a barrier internally. And that wounded area is sacrificed then for the betterment of the whole. Trees are the ultimate survivors in as far as that they'll sacrifice parts for the whole. And when you say cover, did you mean that you put paint on it or something like that? Well, that's, that's what I was going to ask. Uh, Jaquita, did, did you cover it with paint or did you cover it with mulch? She covered it with dirt. That's, there's no problem with that. that it's, the only thing is it, that comes back to the idea that plants heal. Just like we put mature comb or we, we put a, we spit on a sore or a, or a wound or something, plants don't need it because they're sealing it off on the inside. Okay. And uh, I pulled a lot of tree paint and tree coat and things like that off of old trees. And under the paint and under the tar, insects, uh, termites, ants, everything. So, because those critters will find ways to get around what we put on. And keep in mind, each year the tree is gaining in girth, so you got to come out every uh, few months when that tree is growing to put more of that coating on to keep it so things don't get underneath it. And the way that that got started was in orchard work when they would bud and graft and they would uh, seal in the moisture with paraffin wax and coal dust but 
those two things would disintegrate over time. Whereas the modern stuff that you buy in a can, that's there forever. Okay. Um, she added, Joel uh, said that it was a walnut tree that they didn't want to lose. Yes. Um, so it, it did make it so so good. I'm, I'm glad it, it pulled through. Uh, Joel, I don't know. Um, there was a, a gap where I missed. I, I did record this, so I'll, I'll fill in the gap later. But uh, as I was driving back home, I lost signal. I, and you might have mentioned this, and forgive me if you did, but um, I don't know if there are many uh, mature tree preservation crews up, up around Petersburg and Richmond, but that's something that's always uh, I always got got a chuckle out of the fact that people will clear off all the mature, healthy trees and they'll build a house. And the first thing they do is they, they plant a little tree. And um, it, it looks like there would be a lot of opportunity for uh, for tree preservation crews to come in. Uh, we don't have any of those here. I, I know I've worked in other places where those are active, but that's that's something that I'm, uh, I've am i got in the back of my mind to do when I retire is, is, is put together a tree preservation crew. But uh, is that something that you see very often where you are? Uh, yeah, I'm actually, well, with that Algernon Oak there at Fort Monroe, that's in the Remarkable Trees of Virginia, and that is the state champion live oak also. It's the largest live oak. Uh, in this area here in Petersburg, we have the second largest magnolia, uh, uh, cucumber magnolia, magnolia of Cumanata. It's the second largest one. It was supposed to have come from... Monticello, supposed to have come from that area. Okay. Uh, there's a lot, uh, just south of here in Brunswick County, we've got the National Champ White Oak. Uh, there is a thing from Tech, Dr. Kerwin was in charge of it, the big tree hunter uh, that goes throughout the state, actually throughout the world uh, from American Forest. And they have a very stringent a uh, set of rules for measuring trees, height, girth, and, uh, and width, and the whole shoot net, crown spread. And there is a whole, what should I say, industry just about on measuring significant trees. Right. Now, that's what you were referring to, was the large trees or historic trees? Uh, well, actually, just uh, just preserving trees like in a construction site. Oh, oh, I'm I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Okay, uh, a lot of my work is in preserving trees because the echo services of mature trees increases geometrically as they increase in size. It goes from four to eight to sixteen to thirty-two, not one, two, three, four, five. So the larger the tree the more the echo services are for that. And uh, in the Richmond area, 30 years ago, I worked for Best Products to keep their forest trees alive, where they dropped a building and a false wall in a wood. You walk through the false wall, you walk through a wood, you walk into the building. It looks like Raiders of the Lost Ark. And I've worked with Science Museum of Virginia at their place there on Boulevard, working with trying to keep their mature trees alive there, their significant trees. Okay. And it is so much easier to work around the trees than just to doze them over. And I have got a real, uh, we'll say I'm, I'm rather, uh, well, how can I put it nicely, <laughs> vehement about saving trees in home sites doing low impact construction because of the soil pollution or the water pollution that you're creating, the heat islands that you're creating, and it doesn't take much to work around trees with a little bit of care and knowledge. And in the Hanover area where I live, if a person buys a wooded lot, they pay 15% higher for that wooded lot. When they have a builder come in, they generally don't have a wooded lot after the builder leaves. 
but they're still paying uh, inflated taxes on that wooded lot. Also having to pay for the cost of removing trees. So it's a double-edged sword there that the consumer isn't appreciating. Uh, okay. Right. Any well, other questions? Any, any other questions for Joel? Again, don't hesitate to contact me. I, I think my, let's see if my, yeah, there's, there's the contact information. Okay. All right. And if it's okay with you, Joel, I'll post this on our YouTube channel too. I'll send you a link to it once we get this, this up. But, uh, but with yeah. our communications department here at BSU, I'm trying to get a series of tree management, and one would be uh, tree survival and building sites and on YouTube, and we'll see about getting that done. Right. Okay. Because uh, I know in your area, uh, uh, there's a lot of, uh, you, that you cut the ground down to a flat and then put the house on it, right? That's yes. Good. Yeah. And then by doing that, because uh, in Pike County, um, I, I used uh, hemp, that stuff that they put on erosion control for my brother-in-law's house that he built and he, he, he cut that mountain off. He was, his house was getting beat up by rocks because <laughs> uh, no vegetation was left there to hold. Right. Huh. All right, I won't hold you any longer. Oh, no, I appreciate your time. And, oh, thank you for asking me. Well, and we'll, we'll probably uh, try to recruit you again somewhere down the road. Good, I look forward to it. Right. And I, I'll make sure I don't have a feedback here. Right. I wonder if I'm talking too loud. People tell me I talk loud. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, well, the, on uh, you're getting some thank yous here. Uh, Jaquita said thank you for such interesting info. Um, somebody had to leave at seven, but they said uh, they commented uh, thank you for an excellent, uh, excellent information. So, uh, so a lot of, a lot of positive comments there. Well, thank you, thank you. That's always good to hear. And. Uh, for those of you who are interested, uh, on Thursday evening, we have uh, one of my colleagues over in Russell County. Uh, it's uh, Scott Jesse. He's going to be talking about interpreting hay test results. Uh, so if you're interested in that, that's going to be on Thursday evening. And Jeremy, do you have any, any comments for about future uh, Zooms? I don't, I don't think I have anything. Tomorrow's Veterans Day, so thank you to... Right. Uh, or veterans. Absolutely. I'm a Vietnam vet. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, th thank you uh, for your service, Joel. And I know Woody and Merle, uh, who are on here, they're, they're both I, veterans. I see Merle there. So Maybe thank you all. Veterans? Thank you all for your service. Uh, if you would ever want to do one on tree risk assessment, we could do a, a uh, program on tree risk assessment. Yeah, I think that might be that might be worth looking at. Okay. I'll definitely be in touch on that. You guys have a good night. I got a 50 mile drive now. Oh wow. Well, we'll save travels. Because my internet in Hanover is so bad, I wow. came in here to school just so I didn't lose the internet. <laughs> oh wow. Well, well, thank you, thank you for doing that. You guys take care. It was my pleasure. You too. And. Uh, and thanks everybody for joining in and we will we'll see you all soon. See everybody Thursday. Bye bye. Take care. Take care, fellas. I'm gonna leave the meeting. <laughs>